Well, hello everyone. This is the Emporia View Energy Monitor Gen 2. In this video, we're going to run over installation performance, some limitations, some workarounds, and then I'll show you how I've already discovered some areas where the cost of equipment replacement would have a pretty quick payback period. But first, let's take a look at what comes in the box. We've got the control unit, eight branch circuit current monitors, the hardwiring accessories, a Wi-Fi antenna, and two 200 amp service entrance current monitors. If you are wondering if this will fit in what might be a tight service panel, here are the dimensions. We're looking at four and a quarter inches long, three and an eighth wide, and 1.5 inches tall. As far as install instructions go, it doesn't actually come with any, instead directing you to their app. From here, you'll get a step-by-step -step rundown, even going so far as to guide you in different directions depending on your specific wiring situation. All right, so now we're gonna get into the actual installation here. Uh, before the cover is even off the panel, I think it's probably a good idea to go ahead and run through the uh, installation steps in the app, uh, just to familiarize yourself with everything going on, especially if there's anything you want to uh, prep beforehand before you even take the cover off. Um, one thing I personally noticed in app was that we're going to have to pigtail into two adjacent 15 amp breakers for power to the actual monitor itself. So if I go through here, I actually don't have a ton of 15 amp breakers. Most of these are going to be 20 amps. Uh, I do have the 15 amps up here, which are going to be generally like lighting circuits. Um, and just because I think it makes sense, I probably wanted to choose two adjacent breakers that uh, are just theoretically gonna draw the least amount of power. So that would be like guest room lighting circuits, things like that, that uh, just realistically aren't gonna have a big draw on them. Um, so if I go through here, got rec room plugs, see the furnace, oh, that's a 15 and a 20, can't pigtail into that. We've got uh, rec room plugs, upstairs light. So six and eight look pretty good to me. Those are rec room plugs and upstairs lights. Yeah, so I'll probably end up using these two. I'll probably end up using six and eight. So I'm just gonna mark those right there. Just put a little mark on them for future reference so I'll know which ones I use when I close this up. Oh, and by the way, you should probably plan on doing this midday as those evening DIYers might find themselves in a bind if they flip the main breaker and then are subsequently left without lighting. All right, so now we've got the uh, service panel opened up. I kind of want to just run through what we've got going on in here in case anyone's sort of unfamiliar with the general layout of a US style uh, house service panel. If you're already familiar with how these work, feel free to skip forward a couple minutes because this is kind of just going to be a refresher. The very first thing I want to point out is uh, a little bit of a misconception. And a lot of people think that once you flip off this main breaker, you have essentially a dead panel. And that's only half true. Um, what I've got right here is my multimeter. And this particular multimeter has what's called a non-contact voltage detector on it. And that essentially will detect the magnetic field generated by a live electric wire. They're super handy for uh, just double checking you're not working with live wires. So as you just saw, I flipped off the main breaker here. Um, so that's gonna de-energize everything below the breaker. And if we turn on our non-contact voltage detection, we can just kind of run through here. And there's no alarms going off. So we know that all this is indeed de-energized. But what happens if I go above the main breaker? So essentially, the power coming in from the utility is still live, even though I've cut power below it. So just be very careful when uh, you're up here, because even though you've cut off the main breaker, there's still live power in this panel. So just keep that in mind. All right, the next thing I wanted to go over before we get into the meat of this installation is just a general rundown of what's going on in this panel for those that aren't really familiar with residential wiring in the US. Um, and I suspect that if you are considering a home energy monitor, you might be kind of interested in this. You know, if not, continue to skip forward. Um, I realize overall this might look sort of intimidating um, and complicated if you've never opened this up before, but it's actually not that bad once you kind of understand the basics of what's going on. So in the US, uh, almost every household is gonna be powered uh, by a split phase, 120 volt line from the utility. So what that means is that we have 
two hotlines coming in from your service provider right there and right there. And each of these independently are going to be 120 volt lines. Um, in the center, we have our neutral line, which is actually the return line to the utility. Um, so if we tap this and this, we're going to get 120 volts. If we tap this and this, we're going to get 120 volts. And then our big 240 volt circuits tap these two simultaneously um, because one's negative 120 volts and the other's 120 volts. So the difference between those two is actually 240 volts. So that's how we come up with 240 volts from a 120 volt to ground uh, service. Uh, so individually now we go down on these breakers and we see that some of them are again, these uh, two pole breakers are tapping both phases to get our 240 and then the individual breakers are just tapping one of these two at a time to get our 120. And then this neutral right here is actually distributed left and right to these two bars. So all these circuits are going to both tap some hots and some neutrals. Some of the pure 240 volt circuits, which I'm not actually sure even exist in this uh, current panel, but if you had a pure 240 volt circuit, it would actually not tap that uh, neutral, although it would tie into it for the ground. All right, so now moving on to the actual monitor itself. What it's going to do is it's going to clamp around these individual wires that are all hot coming out of the breakers. And similar to how that non-contact voltage detector I showed you earlier just detected the presence of uh, a live wire, it's going to perform a slightly more complicated step and it's going to actually measure that magnetic field and thus be able to infer how much current is running through the um, line at the at a given time. So I'm going to go ahead and clamp it around there and then there's going to be a little magnetic field and that's going to be interrupted when there's current running through it and it's going to know from that interruption how much current. Um, so that's the basics of what's going on in here. We start by installing the antenna. According to the instructions this is supposed to be outside the panel but as mine is recessed that would be difficult so I'm just mounting it inside. However, spoiler alert, this didn't work. Next, we clamp on the 200 amp current monitors. In my opinion, this is the riskiest part of this install because as I previously mentioned, flipping the main breaker only de-energized the panel below and thus we're working around live wires, so be very careful here. It's now time to provide voltage measuring and power to the head unit itself. This is accomplished via a wiring harness. Setup varies depending on your specific application, but if you're like me and have a standard residential split phase 120 volt panel, it goes like this. The white and blue wires both get bonded to the neutral bar. Just find any open spot, they're all the same. The red and black wires need to get pigtailed into two adjacent breakers. It's important they're adjacent as this would imply that each one is tapping a different phase. Important uh, for accurate voltage monitoring. The manufacturer does provide a couple of wire nuts to accomplish this, but I much prefer Wago lever nuts. So easy to use, secure and reversible if you need to make any adjustments. Wire nuts work fine, but I just think these are better. I'll place a link to these below, plus the Emporia view itself. It's an associate link for which the channel will earn a small commission. Use is greatly appreciated. And here's what that setup looks like. We've got a pigtail to the breaker, the two power leads that are part of the view's wiring harness, and then the two conductors leading off to the building's wiring. All right, so the next step I've got is to install all the uh, branch energy monitors. Uh, most of them are pretty straightforward. They'll just clamp over this hot leg here. The one I'm a little unsure of exactly how to set up, I'm just gonna set it up how I think I'll know best and if it doesn't work, I'll have to figure it out, is this breaker right here. This is a 50 amp two pole breaker that's uh, feeding my backyard sub panel. Uh, the only thing that's really on that is my mini split air conditioner which I'm super curious to monitor the energy usage on. Uh, the reason it's a little confusing is because it's a uh, mixed 240, 120 volt circuit. So essentially this 50 amp breaker plus a neutral feed, a, um, a sub panel in the backyard, uh, which does have some 15 amp 120 volt circuits on it, plus the 240 volt um, air conditioner, meaning that the amperage coming out of each of these legs could vary um, so I'm not exactly sure how the app is going to 
compute that, theoretically each of these two would need to be computed separately and then like mathematically combined. Uh, I'm sure it's not that uncommon of a situation where you essentially have a mixed voltage circuit. Um, a lot of appliances run 120 volts and 120 at the same time. So uh, I'm just going to clamp it on each leg and hopefully the app is uh, smart enough to be able to set that up. I then had to decide what specific circuits I wanted to monitor. Basically chose ones where I thought there could be some savings from power monitoring. Things like my office where I'll sometimes run a space heater in the winter. Or my bedroom where I'll often run a portable AC in the summer. Or my fridge where possibly small temperature changes equate to large energy savings. While you're doing this, make sure to keep a list of what monitors get plugged into what spots on the view. You'll need this later for in-app setup. All right guys, so there's everything installed. Looks a little rat nesty there. Kind of wish there was a way to shorten these cords to clean it up a little bit, but alas, there is not. I got the eight pack and I think I got everything monitored I want to monitor, including that backyard sub panel. I got my fridge, uh, the main living room plugs, the furnace. Uh, everything else is pretty minor stuff. All right, so the hard part's done. We installed the current monitor on the service main. We installed the current monitors on the individual branch circuits. We ran power to the energy monitor itself by pigtailing it into two adjacent 15 amp branch circuits uh, and the neutral bar. And finally, we installed the Wi-Fi antenna. So uh, let's turn it back on. Now our house is re-energized, so I think the fun part is uh, setting everything up in the app. During initial setup, I ran into my first problem. I couldn't get the view to connect to my Wi-Fi. Thinking the panel itself was acting like a Faraday cage and interfering with the wireless signal, I opened it back up, removed one of the half-inch knockouts, and stuck the antenna outside the box. This immediately solved the problem, and I was able to connect up without further issue update the unit's firmware, uh, see some initial power draw information, and then start naming my circuits. Remember earlier when I mentioned you should keep a list of what current monitors were attached to which circuits? This is why. Anywho, it's easy to assign some parameters such as outlet type and current multipliers, which is basically another way of saying whether or not the circuit is 120 or 240 volts. The setup did lead me to this product's only real shortfall though, I couldn't figure out how to combine circuits in app. Like I mentioned earlier, to deal with things like my sub panel that might have 240 and 120 volt circuits running simultaneously. Undeterred, I did reach out to support, which you can do very conveniently in app. And although the rep, Jared, did seem to understand the problem, uh, even acknowledging that what he referred to as circuit merging was something the development team was working on, it wasn't something they could handle today. A little disappointing, but the workaround at the moment is to simply combine the wattage from each leg of a mixed 120-240 volt circuit manually. Data is viewable via the Emporia app or on their website, which pretty much just duplicates the app's interface. Here we can view real-time power usage as well as total usage over hours, days, weeks, months, or years. We can also change our units. Watts are default, but we can also view currency uh, for which you'll need to input your utility rates, amps, and some novelty ones that are fun to look at but not all that practical, like CO2. Here I can see that I've used 0.57 CO2 over the last minute, but I have no idea what units these represent. Same story when we change the units to trees. Apparently over the last day I've consumed 0.05 of them, does this mean 5% of a small pine or 5% of a giant sequoia? Seems like kind of a meaningless number. So what can you actually do with this information? Well, for me, the first practical change I plan on making is going to happen in my backyard pond. I quickly saw that my pond pump draws about 250 watts 24 seven. Now, I've often thought that it's too big for my small pond and could easily get away with one about half the size. But with a utility rate of about 15 cents per kilowatt hour, I'm paying roughly $328 a year to run it. That's far more than I would have guessed. It also means that by replacing it with one that draws half as much power, saving $164 a year, it's a no-brainer. You may find similar savings on things like lights, where old incandescents use about 10 times the power of LEDs or maybe on your fridge or air conditioner, where a couple degrees makes a huge difference in total power consumption. 
Overall, a fantastic product. It's got an easy to use app that makes setup effortless. Furthermore, support was quick and knowledgeable. However, I do see the fact that it can't really handle mixed voltage circuits as a significant shortcoming. They're quite common, so not handling them is a big miss. But like Jared at Emporia pointed out, it's one of their top priorities, so I anticipate a software update will fix that shortly.